So, <clears throat> uh, the first question today is about a book which I have not read. Um, it's a book by Bruce Moon, Afterlife Knowledge Guidebook. And um, there is also referred to uh, the Mor Monroe Institute. I have heard of the Monroe Institute, but I have no uh, real detailed knowledge of what they do or don't do or who is involved in the the subjects but so so I can't really comment on it uh, too much um, but I can comment on the more specific question um, about using fantasy as a way to overcome your own blocking assumptions uh, since it will give you the freedom to accept everything as true since you allow yourself to fantasize um, this is indeed a very important uh, key to, uh, to spiritual work and um, also liberating yourself from the um, kind of horizontal programming which we are uh, trapped in. Um, <clears throat> uh, it's, it's in a way a necessity of the brain that it is uh, very critical because our brain itself it generates lots of different memories so much lots of different assumptions of what is going on so if I am um, looking around and I see something my brain is you know, giving me like 10,000 suggestions you're looking at a banana a car a truck a dog a cat a bird and um, depending on the traits which my senses are, uh, are receiving, a certain impulse will become stronger. So I will be more likely to see a bird or a car um, than, for instance, a swimming pool or an airplane. Um, this uh, uh, is a little bit odd because many people, they think that our perception is actually accurate. Uh, but our eyes don't really see anything. Our eyes merely provide information for the brain to help in its categorization process. And um, one of the ways in which this actually comes forward is also in hunting accidents. Um, because hunters, of course, accidentally sometimes shoot other hunters or other people. Um, and uh, these mistakes uh, tend to happen to to have a lot to do with the mental state of the hunter. So there has been some psychological research on this. And uh, especially uh, on the last day of the hunting season, when uh, people have a very strong desire uh, to catch a deer or a boar or whatever, their mind is so filled with the image of the boar that whatever they see, they will see a boar in it. And so you can compare it a little bit to a person who is in love uh, you tend to see his face or her hair or um, something else of that person everywhere. So you're constantly triggered uh, into uh, perceiving that of which your mind is, is engaged in or full with. Um, so we all have our own reality filters. And uh, these reality filters, they can be a blockage, but they can also be a tool for spiritual perception. Um, so for instance, if I am t trying to teach my brain to see something and I have no conception of it. So for instance, I want to see the light cosmos or the dark cosmos and I've only heard the word light or the cosmos or dark cosmos and I have no associations with it. It will be almost impossible for me to have any sensation because even if I open up energetically, um, there is no language. Uh, it cannot become a concrete image or a concrete sensation for me. So therefore it will stay below the consciousness threshold. I might have a notion that there is something there, but it will never become very solid or very practical for me. But for instance, if I have just watched uh, Star Wars and uh, I have this like Hollywood notion of uh, the evil empire with its stormtroopers and the uh, brave rebels um, with their snow speeders and uh, converted cargo ships. Um, 
then if I again focus on the light cosmos and the dark cosmos, uh, these images which exist in my mind uh, can be used. Uh, they, they can be symbols of other things. So instead of like perceiving uh, an entity from the dark cosmos, I will perceive a stormtrooper or instead of a fallen angel I might see Darth Vader and instead of an angel I might see Yoda. Um, so the brain needs actually uh, material for its archetypes, for its associations. And, um, the brain is always um, kind of trapped in its, in its own experiences and um, depending on the, the, the structure of the brain, also often depending on the stress levels, the brain will be less or more free with its own associations. So if a person is very stressed, um, then it is usually that uh, it is necessary to make very quick decisions. It is better to act quickly and incorrectly than not to act at all. So for instance, if you're being hunted by a pack of wolves, um, it is better to, uh, to jump away from something which might be a wolf than to see like, is it a wolf or is it a cat or is it a donkey? Um, so these yeah, more fine distinctions tend to disappear and the brain becomes more rigid in its categorization and its repression of other impulses. So for good spiritual um, yeah, observance it is very necessary to reduce your own stress levels and to try to blank the mind a little bit, to calm the mind a little bit. Because if the four processes are going very quickly, um, uh, this, uh, a very quick thought process is also an indication of a very strong inner critic, a very strong inner repression. And this makes it very difficult for people who have a very mental uh, job or very mental work or very stressful work uh, to have spiritual experiences. Uh, because the brain gets in the system of being highly critical, repressing everything which does not make sense immediately. And yeah, it becomes quicker by focusing all this energy on a very narrow path, on a very narrow train of thought. And what we do by fantasizing is actually trying to broaden uh, that path. You allow yourself to wander around a little bit instead of following a very narrow road. Um, so indeed, uh, fantasy itself is very helpful in developing uh, both uh, a language for your own spiritual experiences and also in uh, training your, uh, your brain to relax and to allow yourself to perceive things or to think things which are not immediately useful or necessary or connected to your daily lives. So uh, besides the uh, psychological process of in a way um, using fantasy as a kind of a, um, a holiday for the brain and also as a kind of a meditation uh, to calm it down, to allow it to also connect. Um, another important thing about fantasy is that it uh, should integrate uh, both the uh, different parts of the brain. Um, so you can fantasize in a visual sense, you can fantasize the smells, the touch, the feel of things, um, uh, the sound, the, the taste, uh, also the emotions, um, your own feelings, your own instincts. And the more complete the fantasy gets, uh, the more parts of the brain can integrate their input into the image. So if I have a very simple fantasy like, um, um, gosh, I would like to, to sit on a beach. Um, and you can only have a visual fantasy of like seeing the white sand and the blue water. Um, that's a very poor fantasy and you should try to add things to it. So add the sound, add the seagulls uh, squawking, the sound of the waves crashing on the beach, um, the feel of the sun on your skin, the coarseness of the sand 
under your hands. And uh, the more involved the fantasy gets, the more uh, parts of your brain uh, are able to contribute to it, the more receptive the brain becomes. Because um, our brain uh, is in a way constantly generating all these images. We have all the, a, a huge archive of all everything we have experienced before. And all these kind of like meta experiences can be combined to uh, new experiences. And um, spiritual energies are very subtle in nature, but also the brain is very uh, subtle. So very slight influences um, can make the brain go this way or that way. So if you're fantasizing about a beach, are you thinking about sand or are you thinking about pebble beach or are you thinking about a rocky cliff? Um, so we have all these different ideas of beaches in our mind and we can choose any of them. And often due to the very subtle influence of the energy around us, we will see either a sandy beach or a rocky beach or a pebble beach. Um, and in this way, all these subtle influences which all of our brain is picking up can be integrated into our experience. So um, it's most important, of course, to use the most sensitive part of your brain. And this is different for every person. Some people are very visual, other people are very tactile, other people are very sensitive to smells. Um, so what is your sharpest uh, sense in the, in the physical world is usually also your w most well-developed sense in a, in a spiritual way because the more subtle influences you can, um, you can pick out on, um, on a physical level, that also means that that part of the brain is very well refined and very capable of picking up very subtle differences in touch, in smell, in color. And um, those very subtle influences are openings for uh, perceiving the energetic worlds, the energetic realms. So try to focus most and try to start also any fantasy with your most developed sense. So if it is touch, first try to feel the sun or feel the air blowing past you and only then open your eyes and see the rest. And if you're uh, auditory, first just hear the sound of the waves and the squawking of the birds and the sound of the surf and the winds blowing through the palm trees and only then start to add the other things because you want the foundation of your fantasy to already be inspired as much as possible by, uh, by the energetic world you're trying to, to envision. Um, yeah, the other thing indeed um, if you indeed block your vision uh, in making it uh, true or not true or desirable or undesirable, that can really indeed limit your experiences. Um, because often, in uh, just like in dreams, a dream is a very good example of, in a way, uh, a very free fantasy. Um, things can happen in your dream which are utterly impossible. You can fly or float through the air or turn into a turtle or something else, which is, of course, to our critical minds, rubbish. Um, but it can happen to us. And in a way, our fantasy should be as free as, uh, as our dreams. Uh, this would be ideal. Um, because then things can happen to us, we can have adventures and have influences and really surrender to them. Uh, we are never completely free. We all have our, our fears, our repressions, our moral standards, um, which keep us from having a truly free fantasy. But in our fantasies, we are already much more free than we are in our daily lives. So it's already a step in a good direction. And the more we can um, remove all these, um, yeah, like real world cultural um, uh, programmings and moral programmings, um, the more we can experience and the more we can allow ourselves to experience, the more things we can allow ourselves to even be curious about. Um, so indeed developing the fantasy and freeing up the fantasy is very important. 
and this is also one of the reasons why there is a very strong uh, link uh, between spirituality and uh, great scientists and great artists um, because they all have to have a very free mind which is uh, very susceptible to subtle in influences. Um, yes, in developing the ability to yeah, experience these invisible worlds. It's a process which um, can be done in a few stages. Um, so the first stage is basically to, uh, to access your memories. So usually we are very uh, stuck in the present or planning the future or uh, rechewing the past. So we're usually on a very narrow, narrow track, um, like we go from here to there and a larger part of our brain is, is not used. So the first step is actually to free ourselves from the track we are, we're on. And uh, this can be done by having a free memory associations about your past. Just wonder about like when you were six years old, when you were in high school, good things which happened to you, bad things which happened to you, your relationship with your parents, your first lover, uh, your first pet. Um, I'm just recalling all these different memories which are in a way purposeless and senseless. Um, this already creates a very uh, more level playing field um, because when the brain relaxes the most it will start repeating the strongest impulse. And if the strongest impulse is usually your work, your daily troubles, then you cannot break free from that. So the first exercise you should do is basically just to try to liberate your memory, to able to wander in your own past, in your own experiences, and uh, revisit everything. <coughs> and doing this actually creates, opens up the library of your, of your brain. Um, for uh, use by the, uh, by the spiritual. So after um, having liberated yourself from your, uh, from your track and from your uh, the focus, um, this is when we can start our fantasies. And usually the first fantasies we have are very narrow, very driven fantasies. Um, so just like dreams, they often um, show our fears, uh, they show our desires, uh, they show the parts of our being which are repressed. Um, so a lot of the, the, the fantasies which we end up in are uh, basically just reflections of our own inner tension, our own inner pressure. So the first fantasies we will have are usually um, not very spiritual but rather psychological in nature. Um, they can often um, be um, like a, a catharsis, a release of something. Um, so often things which are uh, forbidden. Uh, so for instance you're not allowed to uh, to kill your boss or uh, um, to rape the attractive person. Um, so often these taboo subjects they turn into yeah, rather perverted uh, fantasies. This is not by definition something to be afraid of or to run away from or to feel guilty about um, because it is always true that if an energy cannot flow freely um, it becomes very twisted. Um, so that's like anger or dominance becomes twisted into killing or maiming or sadism and that sexuality and love becomes twisted also in um, dominance, uh, rape. Um, uh, this is actually a, a normal psychological process and as we uh, free up these energies you usually see a normalization occur. So the, the first fantasies we, uh, we open up to tend to be rather intense, rather dark. Um, but if we continue doing that, this energy which has in a way then can flow more freely, 
uh, they turn into a lighter vibration. They become more positive, more uh, normal, uh, because the whole um, anger, the frustration, um, which is uh, making them turn into dark fantasies, uh, also becomes released if we let allow ourselves uh, this freedom. So, after these um, process of processes of clearing up our um, our desires, um, we also have to clear up our fears, um, because our fears usually block us from um, from going somewhere. So often it is very difficult to fantasize about the things you are afraid of, um, but ultimately they will either disturb your contact with the spiritual world. Um, or uh, block you from going any further um, or they will uh, manifest themselves, intrude upon you uh, at some point. So they always tend to uh, mess up the, the process of having a, a really good perception of the, of the energetic world. Um, so the fears have to be dealt with either sooner or later and I prefer to do it sooner rather than later. Um, fears are, are usually based on, on the ego um, because our spirit is immortal and it tends to see everything as you know, being illusionary or transitory uh, or virtual reality just for us that like we're not afraid when watching a movie that if we see a person falling off a cliff it's a bit thrilling for us but we don't think we will die and it is the same for a spirit, like, yeah, of course, it's rather thrilling to see all the sensations your body is going through, but you will always be okay. It's a bit like a roller coaster ride for the spirit. But the ego has a very different experience. The ego has a lot of really strong fears. And it is also possible for a spirit to have some fears, but that doesn't happen as much and those are a lot harder to deal with. But the basic survival fears of the ego are quite strong and uh, these fears can be very literal fears for uh, for dying but also for indirect death like if you are ridiculed uh, not accepted uh, not useful uh, not found attractive um, all this is death because if you're not attractive you won't have offspring and that will also mean death from the perspective of the ego and if you're not accepted by the group, that can also mean death, because nobody will help you or support you when there is a danger. Um, so all these fears are basically death fears of the ego. And um, they have to be released, ultimately, to, uh, to move into the more spiritual realms of fantasy. And releasing these um, ego structures is, is not an easy thing. So you have to open up to a pattern. You can't allow the pattern to become too strong because then it will become dominant. And you don't want to be controlled by your fears and turn into a phobic or neurotic person. Um, but the ego also needs to um, uh, need space to, to work with it. And one of the um, fantasies you can indulge in is actually your own death. It may seem a little bit morbid, but it can be very liberating to actually um, go through various death fantasies. Seeing yourself drown or uh, bleed to death or um, fall to death or um, die from old age or from sickness or from hunger or from different things. Um, because if you die in your fantasy, in a way you're dealing with that fear but also seeing that gosh i continue i still exist even if that which is seemingly the worst possible thing would happen to me so you're slowly but surely in a way trying to get the ego to accept the idea of its own death you try to train it into not stressing out or panicking all the time uh, so that it can just open up and relax more. Um, because a lot of spiritual experiences, uh, a lot of spiritual transitions from one level of consciousness to another, 
actually involve a kind of a symbolic death because you have to leave part of yourself behind, the part which cannot move with you to a higher consciousness. So learning to deal with death, at least on a fantasy level, is, uh, is very necessary uh, to get into touch with, uh, with higher worlds. <clears throat> so after we have um, gone through this process, of um, uh, allowing ourselves uh, to, to fantasize really, really freely and be really open to everything which, uh, which might come, which might show itself. Um, then we come to the really interesting phase of surrendering. Um, because when we create fantasy, we start to fantasize, we are basically uh, building up something out of our own energy body. And um, when we uh, do this, what we think about, and what we feel, is also visible energetically. So it's already a, a kind of a communication. Um, and by uh, fantasizing, by cr in a way creating this fantasy world, this dream world, um, we are building a, a kind of a meeting place in, uh, in a higher world, in the astral sphere. And if we fantasize about different things all the time, now high, now low, um, then these places are very unstable. Um, they exist only for one fantasy for maybe half an hour or an hour, and then they disappear again. So it is not very useful as a meeting place because yeah, they are more seen as, as your personal playground. Um, so in your fantasies you should try to always go to the same place. So envision a place which to you is your spiritual temple, your spiritual home. Um, for some people it's, a, it's actually a physical building, some people imagine a Greek temple or an Egyptian temple. Uh, for other people it's a natural place like um, um, uh, a hill with a tree on it or a volcano or a mountain um, and by actually re keep on, on revisiting the place uh, that place becomes a more solid place uh, it will start to exist even if you're not thinking or fantasizing about it and um, usually if you've visited a place about a dozen times roughly um, it will start to have a little bit of a consistency so that when you revisit it, uh, you will notice, gosh, there are certain details or certain things about it which you didn't think of, which you didn't imagine. It will start to have a little bit of a life of its own. And when these fantasies start having a life of its own, it's also when they become um, tools in a way for other spirits or other worlds uh, which want to contact you. And by altering, in a way, the world you have created, or taking form in the world you have created, they can show themselves to you, they can communicate with you. And then you, in a way, start to co-create um, this in-between place, this astral meeting place. And um, if you want to meet uh, uh, an egregore, an egregore is actually uh, yeah, such a place. It's a co-created uh, place in the astral sphere um, where many uh, yeah, spirits have all contributed their own fantasies, their own elements to. So in a way an egregore uh, can be seen as a city. So everybody has their own home, their own building, their own works of art, their own furniture. Um, and it is all part of the same construct of the same city. Uh, that doesn't mean that every egregore uh, in our fantasy looks like a city, but it is the, the nature of the egregore. Um, so it, it can be a herd or it can be yeah, a colony and it can just be a, a mix of all kinds of various different things like a, a sea full of fish and different sea, sea creatures. But it is always a collective uh, which is created also collectively. And so, in a way, by working with our fantasy, um, 
and we're not really creating an egregore but we're creating a kind of an egregore like structure and if you uh, for instance want to work on developing your dream body and meeting other people in your dreams it's basically exactly the same process you have to create a meeting place uh, a place of union uh, a spiritual school um, and that has actually like yeah like you have an, an IP address an internet address um, things also have a spiritual address and by knowing the name or by knowing the symbol of uh, someone or something you can try to tune in and hone in on that energy and go to that place in the astral sphere so but the first practice should be just to be able to create your own reality um, because that is also creating your own language um, and your own theme so for instance if you love westerns well every spirit and everything will show itself in a western theme and if you're a fan of boxing it will show itself in that theme so it's kind of a reality filter through which you can see the spiritual world and as you get more experience in dealing with the, the spiritual entities themselves uh, you will need this reality filter less and less and you will get closer and closer to the essence so it will drift further and further away from the um, uh, real world's language and constructs which we use to translate it and you will see the actual thing and you, your brain will actually build up a model uh, slowly but surely of what a spirit looks like, what a god looks like, what an angel looks like, what an egregore looks like and it will slowly develop its own language uh, which can be in symbols or in sounds or in tactile sensations so it's not always uh, a visual fantasy okay <clears throat> So the next question is a little bit connected to this. Um, what are the things that may go wrong after death? What should one pay attention to? Um, there are probably a lot more things besides illusions which can adversely affect the path of the soul. Well. Um, there are indeed quite a lot of things which can go wrong after death, but usually things tend to go well rather than poorly. So even though it's a very important process, things tend to go well naturally. Um, there are a few reasons why things tend to go well. Uh, one of the reasons is the amount of support we have. So there are guides who help us, there are ancestors who, uh, who help us, there is the experience our spirits have from dying before. Um, so it is generally not something to be uh, extremely afraid of. Um, but yeah, it, it can go wrong. Um, there are a few types of problem which, which can happen. Um, one problem is that um, you're unable to find your way into a higher world um, and this inability can be due to that your your own spirit has too much heavy energies is too earthbound so you're really identifying with your uh, with who you are as a human body and your role as a human being in the, in the material world and if you have no concept of your own spiritual self um, then it is very difficult to move your consciousness uh, into this higher level which is necessary so having a very low consciousness is is dangerous a very materialistic um, uh, sense of being uh, can trap your spirit um, so often you find that, that most of the people who start to, uh, to wander, whose spirit become wandering spirits, um, have worked very little uh, with their own spiritual development in life. So people who have some concept of their higher being, higher self, tend to, to move on uh, quite easily. Um, 
but of course as we go into a more and more materialistic age we see the percentage of people who get stuck uh, becomes higher and higher because people yeah, have less and less uh, spiritual development. Mm. Another problem which, um, uh, which can happen is that in the uh, place you exit that there is no uh, way to, to go to a higher world. So uh, naturally um, there are always portals usually every couple of kilometers. Uh, there is a, an opening, a place where the veil between worlds is thin so you can easily slip into a, a, higher, a place of higher consciousness. And uh, usually if you do nothing, you, if you just follow the energies which are flowing around you, you will be taken to such a place. But the energy grid of the earth can become disturbed. And it is also in a way becoming more and more damaged and more and more disturbed. Uh, because we tend to remove nature spirit um, who are in a way maintaining the energy grid. Um, another problem is that many holy places also become corrupted or uh, and very few holy places are founded anymore. And uh, these holy places, which are in a way natural uh, also uh, openings into higher worlds, um, can become, uh, yeah, can just fall apart due to lack of maintenance or they can become blocked. And then also the, the spirit will follow the flow. Um, because it doesn't know where it is going and it will end up in a place which is basically a dead end because the door has been closed. So uh, a disruption in the in the earth energy, the place where you uh, where you die can be it can also make it pretty much impossible for you to move on. Um, so there are such really cursed places which uh, uh, trap souls um, and these trapped souls are often um, used or abused by uh, by other entities. Um, so these are um, uh, there are beings and people who, in a way, um, live of uh, dead spirits or use dead spirits, and they are actively disturbing the grid and harvesting. Uh, yeah, the people aren't animals uh, who get stuck in uh, in such a place. Um, there are a few uh, famous places like this, uh, battlefields, and usually the spirits who um, who live there or feed on them are rather uh, demonic in nature, but they're also necromantic people who um, who use such uh, spirits. Um, also in parts of religious wars uh, this can happen so sometimes that like taking the holy place or destroying the holy place from the other religion is not enough but they also want to block all the people associated with that other religion from reaching higher worlds um, so this is um, a rather problematic state of affairs. Uh, currently the energy grid of the earth is still quite good, quite healthy, but there are some dark egregores which are very actively trying to, um, you know, trying to destroy this and remove this to uh, prevent in a way a spiritual progress on the earth so that really the earth will become a prison which yeah, spirits can be born into but can never leave and with themselves, of course, as the, as the prison guards or the uh, head jailers uh, controlling their yeah, you know, a trapped slave army. So, um, although these egregores are not very friendly, they are very powerful and they actually have various incarnated masters and a lot of people supporting them usually unconsciously. Um, so that's also something which uh, can go wrong after death. Um, so one uh, very good way to prevent that is actually to have your own little gate or your own little portal. So uh, having a blessed object which uh, um, can be a crucifix or an icon or any other uh, conduit which is basically an opening directly between a higher world and our world can be used after death to um, to leave 
um, um, yeah, this uh, this plane of existence. Um, it's actually uh, also a, 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 a shamanic habit. So the uh, Native Americans, when they uh, went in, went to war or went into another situation where it was likely they could get killed, um, they would take uh, a stone with them, um, which opens, which actually elevates their energy body, so that even when if they die, they're already past the point of getting stuck. So you can use a, a crystal for this to yeah, ensure that yeah, no matter where you die or what happens, uh, your energy body is already in this higher state of awareness, so it will not get, uh, get trapped. Um, so there are various ways to, uh, uh, to prevent that from happening. Um, another problem which is also um, occurring more often is basically the conservation of the body. Um, the body is, is basically the, the temple where our, our consciousness resides in, what's in a way also a magnet. So our spirit, when it leaves the body, it is also pulled back into the body. And for instance, if I die and my body is preserved in some cryogenic way, um, or also, um, um, yeah, sometimes by freezing it or sealing it in vacuum or whatever kind of strange method, Anyway, as long as the body is intact, also the spirit remains linked to the physical world. Um, this can be used in a positive way, so it's very much well known that also the bodies of saints tend to remain incorrupted. So, uh, because the saint wants to perform miracles, it wants to help people on the earth, and therefore it maintains uh, a connection with the physical world. So. Even though its spirit is on a higher level, its energy can easily flow back into its body and through the body help many people. Um, but if you want to move on and to reincarnate, the intactness of your body can also yeah, be very problematic, very damaging, very blocking. Um, so it can also trap your spirit. Um, so it is usually safer uh, to be eaten or uh, to be burned, then uh, have your body preserved in some manner. Other things which can happen is, uh, well, I already mentioned it a little bit, is that your soul can become trapped. So um, that a group of other spirits will gang up on it, or that a living person will, uh, will grab it and will refuse to let go of it. And this is basically the danger of um, dying in a, in a very bad place. So, for instance, if you would uh, visit the battlefields of the First World War, uh, like Verdun and Ypres, where hundreds of thousands of people um, suffered and died uh, in a very small uh, space, the energetic structure of the planet is unable to clean up all these energies so it gets completely the drain of negative energy gets blocked by this huge amount of these energies and the low vibrations there because of all the aggression and fear well, attracts lots of negative entities and um, uh, people who die in such a place can easily become trapped by these negative entities um, who seek to either use or enslave or feed off uh, the, the person who died. Um, so maintaining both the, the, the structural integrity of the earth um, but also repairing uh, uh, places like this or preferably even preventing places from these like coming into existence is very important. Um, so one of the important advices which unfortunately is not really adhered to is also to use hospitals and insane asylums for only like maybe 40 years 
and then move them to a different location so that all the energies which is built up there can slowly diffuse and be consumed because places where there's so much fear and suffering uh, they create a very toxic energetic atmosphere and eventually because of this very negative energy which is there they attract negative spirits and these negative spirits will yeah make healing very difficult in such a place and also if people die in such a place they will become trapped um, so especially cancer wards um, are places which should be cleaned regularly and moved regularly to prevent such dead ends and traps coming into existence. Um, so these are the things which in a way um, yeah, come to mind now when I'm talking about things which go wrong, could go wrong after death. Um, one of the things uh, you can do is um, you can ferry people out of such a place but um, if there are indeed negative spirits they don't like people doing that um, so you can run into some resistance if you're trying to, to help spirits in such a place um, you can also try to open a door in such a place so that spirits can escape more easily um, this also requires some effort, you can also run into some resistance and also doors can be broken down again so that the, the door you opened will close again. Um, so these processes are best done with a lot of support. So it's best if you want to heal the landscape to do it with a group and before you go into it to really um, Try to get support from local uh, nature spirits and also from um, uh, divine spirits who are very in, who have a very strong interest into in the continuous uh, spiritual progression of spirits in the world and keeping all these gates open. <coughs> and if you're talking about egregores, the uh, Templar egregore is very active in this uh, in this process of maintaining a healthy energy body for the earth. And also druidic arts are very involved also in, uh, in creating and maintaining these, uh, these holy sites. Mm. Yeah, if you are involved or if there are um, indeed um, people performing black magic or trapping spirits, um, this is very difficult because the very people you're trying to save are also your enemies. So uh, both demons and uh, uh, necromancers tend to create slave armies. And um, the persons in these slave armies, they basically have to do what they're told to have any chance of freedom or any chance of relief. So often they're like indentured servants. So after you have served them for, I don't know, a hundred years, three lifetimes, uh, then they will release you, or at least so they promise. And the person in desperation, they will yeah, accept any help they can. But yeah, that can make it rather awkward. Um, it's very important to... Um, to realize that in a way your enemy is not always your real enemy they're just soldiers following orders or people who are trying to fight their way out or into a, a better world um, and they're just in illusion or in delusion as to uh, who the real enemy is uh, because they often become tricked by the power and the light of the still living people or of the uh, of the demonic entities which are uh, controlling them um, which in their eyes are the highest spiritual beings they can perceive um, so they often think they are doing good or serving god or whatever in attacking you while you're trying to help them so it's it's a tricky business and also a little bit dangerous to to help people where things have gone wrong after death. Um, when dealing with um, 
uh, with such a, an area it is often uh, most important also to uh, remove the magnet so if a place will stop attracting these negative energies uh, then it will become much easier to clear because the negative energies will find other places more interesting and might may start to leave of their own accord so usually if you can do something about the astral groove of pain, suffering, hatred, fanaticism, um, ideology, uh, or whatever uh, got stuck there, uh, then usually at least the demonic entities will start to leave such a place alone. Uh, because demonic en uh, entities are very interested in trapping the entirety of humanity by making these delusions and these lower vibrations as strong as possible on our planet. So the more they can feed our, um, our sins um, or other uh, uh, spiritual dead ends like hatred, nationalism, uh, fear, then um, they can trap us in a very low state of awareness and keep us focused on these very low uh, low level goals in life um, and they will yeah, defend and create such places but yeah once their hold on it is broken and there's no longer this strange illusionary energy uh, trapping beings also the uh, yeah, demonic entities themselves will feel less at home there and will start to vacate the place and it will become a lot easier to, to liberate the remaining spirits. Um, often also places like this can be um, created um, by people who are in a way uh, guided or misguided by negative uh, entities. Um, so I know of several spiritual groups who create holy sites, which are in a way unholy sites, in um, ordered by egregores or by aliens um, who in a way inspire them to transform the earth and by in a way um, performing rituals or drawing symbols which um, put the energy there in a certain pattern and patterns are by their nature stagnant um, and tend to um, yeah, remove the flow from the surrounding area so nature will start to suffer, spirits won't be able to move on. Um, so if you start working with symbols or rituals in nature, uh, you should always be very aware that you're not disturbing the natural flow or creating a blockage, even though your intentions may be light or good. Many people are deceived in such a way and yeah, they start destroying our world energetically. And unfortunately there is a lot more disturbance going on even though it is well intentioned then there is repair going on uh, so it's unfortunately a little bit of an underused and or lost skill uh, fortunately there is a good amount of knowledge uh, still available in uh, druidic circles in shamanic circles and also in anthroposophical circles on how to repair and restore and help the, the natural beings and how to create holy places and how to restore holy places um, but it's important also to realize that uh, spirituality is never about one fixed ideal uh, it is more about journeying towards something and ultimately surpassing it it can never be a dead end got a question here yes indeed this is a very good point um, I uh, got a remark here that uh, for these trapped spirits it's much easier in a way to interact with uh, with humans than it is to interact with higher guides or higher spirit guides or other beings which uh, which are there trying to help them 
so that we as incarnated humans also have a very important role in, uh, in helping these spirits who are trapped in their illusions and in their dead-end ideals. <coughs> I think I've already recounted once this uh, story about the, the graveyard in Australia where people were waiting for Judgment Day when God would come and raise their bodies and restore them and govern them for their, uh, to continue their life on earth. So this is also an ideal which is in a way a dead end because they just sit there and don't move on. Um, and, uh, there are many of these dead end ideals um, and ultimately the, 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 the spirits has to have both the strength um, to exert its own free will and to, 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 to overcome its programming. And sometimes the programming can be very strong, uh, depending on their life which they lived and also on the place where they die. Um, and it is important in a way to allow the spirit to realize um, that it is not getting anywhere because they think they're moving forward they're going towards a goal because they have a very different idea of time for a spirit to be stuck somewhere for a couple of hundred years it can also seem like a moment to them um, and um, the more the spirit becomes uh, gets into contact with the real flow of life of seasons of change um, the more it will start to realize that it is not moving, it is actually stuck. So, um, actually um, having uh, also strong emotions also tends to help. So life force, strong emotions, everything which alters. Because if you're happy one moment or sad the next, if you're playing a game for instance and you make a good move and you have a bad move, uh, that tends to clear the atmosphere. So uh, being somewhere and playing games or having children there and playing games, that also tends to uh, release uh, bound spirits because they will start to wake up and to realize, gosh, my emotions are always the same, my thoughts are always the same, I'm not having the same life as these people are having. Uh, so the more free and playful you are, uh, the better you are able to, to help these uh, spirits which are stuck in the pattern. It's a little bit like being a civil servant with, with a day which never ends. It's endless repetition. Uh, but the civil servant also gets in such a pattern, in such a rote of repetitive work like a machine. And um, these trapped spirits also, also become like machines, very trapped in habitual repetition. Um, so they don't really adapt anymore. They lose the essence of what it means to be a human being, and that is curiosity. Um, so playfulness, curiosity, openness can really help these spirits to, uh, to see and realize their own state and to start to open up and to move on. So thank you very much for that comment. <coughs> So the question is, how can anyone benefit from a soul that is stuck? And what could I tell some more about the slave souls? Well, um, to certain beings. Um, so with certain beings, I mean uh, demonic beings, um, dark angels, um, things like that. Um, they basically see themselves as prison guards. Um, and this is their universe. They are the lords of this universe, of the fallen universe. And they see spiritual evolution as people trying to escape from prison. And they feel that, yeah, in a way, uh, they're doing their duty by in keeping people who they consider unready or unfit to go into heavens away from the heavens, away from the light egregores away from disturbing higher worlds by trapping them in lower worlds. So on one hand it is duty. Uh, on the other hand it can also be 
uh, greed or illusion for control, like a dictator who, like for instance, builds an iron wall in, um, uh, in, in Berlin to keep its citizens from escaping. Um, so they have their own pattern and everybody has to follow their pattern and they can't really tolerate it when people rebel or follow a different path. Um, it's also the spirits who follow the, the, yeah, the spiritual path, they're in a way emptying their, uh, their universe, their universe is becoming empty and then they're like a king without a subject, a boss without yeah, a country or a people to, to govern and they don't like that. So in a way just trapping people is, is a function of their, of their nature and it is also their, their job. Um, of, and this is also our job to try to uh, develop ourselves so we can escape these, uh, these controls, escape the watchers and this is also which forces us to develop our skill, our willpower, our insight. Um, because just as, um, yeah, in a way, we evolve to escape them, they also are forced to evolve, to grow, to keep us trapped. And by their growing, eventually they too become ready to leave this universe and to reintegrate into the heavens. So it's a little bit of a, yeah, of a spiritual plan. Uh, but on an individual level, on, like on a cosmic level, it's a good thing. But on an individual level, it can be a tragedy. Um, so about the slave souls, um, what, uh, what happens is that often a part of their own being is ripped away from them. So, um, and often it's an essential part. So they can't transform or they can't actually go into a higher world without it because it is very much a, a core part of their, of their spirit. And this core part is in a way um, held by the, uh, the necromancer and it's like a hostage. So uh, if you do what I say, if you give me my million dollars, uh, you will get it back and you can continue with your life. And if not, I will destroy it or disrupt it or poison it or curse it and you will never be able to move on with your spiritual life. You will go into uh, a negative incarnation, you will lose your humanity, you will go to another dimension. Um, so uh, both demons and humans um, are in a way in the, in the job of hostage taking or um, blackmailing spirits uh, to control them. So it is very similar to um, yeah, how criminal organizations work, how the mafia works, how the government works. Because they control the conditions which are necessary for your progress. And therefore you have to conform to their system of progression. Um, otherwise you will not be allowed an opportunity for your own type of progress. Um, so it's very much um, yeah, a, a police state which they end up in, where uh, in a way they are enforced to spy on each other, to inform it on each other, to prevent escapes. And um, yeah, it's, it's very much yeah, really a police state, like uh, a prison, and our whole cosmos is a prison, but it's a lot more evident in uh, in these cases. Um, such a slave servant, the easiest way to, uh, to help them is actually to give them back the missing parts. But to give them back the missing parts of their being would mean that you have to liberate them. And there are various methods of, of trapping them. The most usual method of, um, of uh, um, yeah, of storing um, these stolen parts of the energy body is by uh, putting them inside the, the energetic body of the earth. So often if you go deep into deeper energetic layers of the earth, they're um, like either necromancers or uh, demonic entities will have a little cache 
of yeah in a way human heart <laughs> you could say um, of the people they're trying to control and by digging up this cash and redistributing or releasing these energies uh, is the best way to save them um, and sometimes such um, a spirit can be uh, can be argued with because also a demon or uh, a necromancer is also trapped because it works both ways they can trap humans to stay on the level of awareness but to be able to trap and communicate with the humans they themselves are also trapped on that level of awareness and are unable to move forward or unable to move on so you have ultimate power but zero freedom and this is the price you pay for for power and this is always the case uh, the more control the more power you want to have the more of your energy body the more of your consciousness has to concentrate and focus on that one spot to manifest that power to get that ultimate control but that also means that you have to liberate to to lose all your freedom and all your uh, broad range of energies and experiences so it's always a choice between freedom and power and you have to find uh, the mix which is right for you but uh, beings who in, engage in this uh, slave taking they have usually traded all their freedom for ultimate power and sometimes they can be uh, shown that they yeah are also stuck they're also trapped just like the spirits they're trapping and often uh, people who do this uh, or entities who do this have been doing this for thousands of millions of years even and um, Occasionally they do get tired of it and they want to be released, but because also the habit of these thousands or millions of years is so strong, they cannot break it themselves. So they need somebody to help them by disrupting or destroying their energy body. Um, so actually by destroying the energy body of uh, uh, a demonic entity or uh, of a necromancer, you might actually be helping them or setting them free again. Or giving them at least another opportunity do you want to go back there and go back into your old habits or do you want to move into a different direction and move into different habits and usually my experience is after their energy body is broken up they're actually quite happy that they have been stopped and have been broken up um, and because they are, are accumulating lots of negative karma by doing this and the sooner their, this process is stopped the more freedom uh, and the more beneficial it is so uh, you don't need to have a lot of qualms about um, fighting in in these cases uh, to uh, to help the trapped spirits um, necromancy is uh, is an art which used to be practiced in uh, a lot in uh, uh, medieval europe but um, actually it has now pretty much left Europe. There are hardly any necromancers uh, left. Um, there's a little bit of necromancy uh, still being practiced in Europe by people who uh, follow the uh, West African tradition um, or the voodoo tradition which is based on the West African tradition. Uh, but almost all necromancy which is, uh, which is done comes from the United States where it was very popular. Um, in the 19th uh, century, uh, people uh, in the US weren't fundamentalist Christians, as more or less the tendency has been lately, but were actually quite spiritual people. And actually with spiritual people, I mean spiritist people. They used to commune with spirits a lot. And this was the most common uh, religious belief, that there, was, there were spirits and um, yeah that people could commune with them and work with them so in america there is a huge body of knowledge and a lot of experience in working with the deceased and basically as um, this knowledge started to pass away from uh, from common groups it became more and more monopolized by uh, yeah small spiritual fringe groups um yeah who uh, yeah, continue these practices for their own purposes and the, their purposes are usually not so malign 
uh, they usually involve self in self improvement. Uh, so the idea is that, gosh, I can learn from all these people who have been here before. Uh, they can uh, give me things which they don't need anymore. Their knowledge, their skills, their memories. Um, they're not using them anymore. They have no use for them. So why shouldn't I use them and benefit from them? And actually in the Americas, they, there are also groups we, who um, spend their time collecting uh, body parts of famous people, of powerful people who have a lot of talents, a lot of abilities. Um, so um, yeah, I've run into some groups who, yeah, in a way, um, organize funerals for poor people or sick people. Um, yeah, officially to help and to benefit the poor, to provide decent burials. But really they uh, yeah, use this opportunity to yeah, gain control over the body and thereby also gain control over the spirit which used to inhabit the body and to, uh, to trap it. Um, and this goes on into yeah, quite high circles. So there are quite a few uh, people in, um, yeah, in government, in, in the media, um, who are involved in, uh, in working with uh, the, the spirits of the deceased and um, knowingly or unknowingly are helping to, uh, to trap these spirits or to uh, harvest the spirits of the dead who are still uh, yeah, wandering about. But in uh, Europe, there's not so many people who are actually uh, involved in this process. Uh, but there are demonic entities who are involved in this process. One of the unfortunate things is that this American um, habit of, uh, uh, of trapping spirits travels with them. So as in a way the Americans start to build companies, uh, especially in South America, but also spreading to Europe and Asia. Uh, there are also people who bring these habits with them of, uh, yeah, of trying to uh, grab local powerful spirits and um, some of the interesting spirits are often the spirits also of saints, of people who um, in a way have stayed behind voluntarily to help maintain holy places, places of power. And um, yeah, these American necromancers, they go to these places of power specifically to find these spirits who have lots of knowledge and lots of talents and to seek to enslave them. So it's a problematic thing. But yeah, it's, it's for most common people they won't run into, into problems like these. It's really a fringe group. But I tend to end up on the fringes, <laughs> so... Um. Ah, okay. So two more questions. We've already gone on, on for quite a long time, but I want to yeah, end the topic. Um, what role do other people's prayers for the past or person have? Is there anything the living ones can do for the benefit of the one who has died? I see some more remarks popping up. Ah, necromancers. Um, um, yes. Uh, uh, necro is, is, is basically black or uh, death. Uh, so necromancy is, is basically the, the art of, of death magic or magic which involves life force because a necromancer is also usually a very good healer because they are experts on using life force uh, and also spirits. Um, so meeting them personally, yes I did and I've been yeah, in, yeah run into some of their works. Um, I met some of them after their death, I met some of them while still living. Oh yes, so the use of prayers and doing something for the deceased. So um, uh, prayers are very 
important um, because of uh, authority. Um, the person who has in a way died um, has lost a little bit of authority. They cannot uh, request for things to to happen on a physical level anymore. So in a way they are very unable to protect their home, to protect their belongings, uh, to protect their body. Uh, so a large part of their own energy body becomes very vulnerable to other entities or to abuse or misuse or accidents. And by uh, praying uh, you can in a way um, help to transfer all the energies which are still on a physical level and uh, give them back to the spirit on a higher level. So if you for instance look at Chinese burial rites, they often make a little uh, dollhouse, a maquette of their home, it's also in Egyptian burial rites and paper money uh, and other things. So everything which exists for the person on the physical level is made on a, created on a fantasy level, on a symbolic level and then in a way um, all the energies which exist on this physical level are also transferred into this higher fantasy plane and then given back to the spirit. So the process of, in a way, uh, of, of burial gifts uh, is really helping the person to move on, to take all the energies with them so they're not trapped or locked into objects which are very dear to them or which still hold a lot of their energy. And this is a much, uh, you can of course burn down their houses and burn their bodies, but this is a nicer and symbolic way so their children and families have actually some, something of an inheritance. And um, this is also, um, you should do it in the right way because burning a dollhouse or some monopoly money is not doing anything. You really have to see or allow the, the, the symbol to absorb the, the physical energies and then transfer it uh, uh, to this spiritual level and this transfer can be done by burning it or by burial. Um, so that is something which can be done and also through prayers the, uh, the body and also uh, other objects can be uh, handed over uh, two spirit guides or two death angels or other things who can help with this transformation or give it back to the spirit when the spirit is ready to deal with them or to let go of them. So these are also important things. Also through prayer uh, people can, um, can call for two very important principles justice and mercy. Um, so especially when the person who has died has very little knowledge of higher spiritual beings, they may not realize how or when to apply to this divine justice or divine mercy. But servants of divine justice and mercy can be invited to, to help with the transition, uh, to guide the transition by prayer. And it's usually a good case to call for both unless you're relatively vengeful and you only want divine justice to apply to that person. Divine justice is not a negative thing, but it's, it's very compassionate to also, uh, yeah, to pray for, for mercy for the person who died. Um, So yeah, other things which are important is in a way um, helping the, the, the person to, to let go. So sometimes the person has things which are unfinished and um, it can be very difficult for the person to, to move on if they feel bound. So for instance, if they're leaving behind uh, a loved one or when they're leaving behind a great work which is unfinished, like they were working on a book or a painting or some other life's work and they have not finished it, then often yeah, they will become a ghost or a wandering spirit drawn to artists or other people who are working on a similar work. So in a way, uh, tidying up affairs for the person who died is a very important thing. So that they know that yeah, their, their place is being filled 
So finding uh, another father or mother for the children or another lover for, uh, for the partner, um, another uh, person to take care of their dog or their cat or their house. Uh, assuring that these things are well taken care of also really help for the person to let go and to move on because then they can have faith and confidence that they're really not needed anymore. Um, this can be very uh, reassuring. Uh, occasionally also the uh, deceased person uh, requires energies for the transformation. So um, making a sacrifice or actually inviting the spirit to come into your body and use your energy body for its transformation uh, are also methods to, uh, to use the deceased, uh, to help the deceased. Um, as I said, like allowing a dead spirit to enter into your body is rather, can be rather dangerous, so you should only do that with somebody you really know and trust and be rather careful not to allow the wrong person in. Um, but making a sacrifice like offering some food which also considers some, contains some life force for them to work in their transformation progresses, uh, processes can be really helpful. Um, also trying to help and guide the spirits because often death can be rather confusing especially if the person has very little spiritual awareness or very little preparation. Um, so reading the Tibetan Book of the Dead or something similar so in which you explain the person of what is going on, what is happening, what is the purpose, where they should be going is also extremely helpful especially if the person is so stuck that they can't make contact with the, their own guides or the death angels yet. So the question is, what of people dying of dementia with disturbed thought process, processes? Do they have difficulty in going to a good place in the afterlife? Um, sometimes. Uh, basically the, uh, the spirit is very free of the, of the limitations which the body imposes on them. So in a way after a death, their, uh, their, conscious, their consciousness is clear, it is no longer trapped by the malfunctioning brain. Um, but it, dementia can have an indirect effect which can be harmful to the spirit. Namely that the, uh, dementia can be a very uh, frightening process or a very depressing process. That when the person is half aware that they are not well or that they cannot comprehend the world anymore. And so they can be in a state of fear or anger or frustration. And these negative energies, these negative vibrations, they don't disappear when the body dies. So indirectly, people can suffer from dementia uh, when dying, but not directly. And as soon as the person uh, dies, they will find themselves still stuck with the negative emotion, but they're ability to transform it will be just as good as ever uh, but it requires more time and more effort to uh, for a person who died in a yeah in a bad energetic state uh, to move on than for a person who died in a very good energetic state so one of the things to do is also to um, to try to ease the passing as much as possible so to hold the hand of a person who's dying or to surround him with love or candles or good energies or things like this, that really ensures a very quick passing to a higher world um, rather than a slow struggle through, through all kind of muck and fears and other things. Uh, so both the life a person has lived but also the moment of passing are, uh, are very important to the yeah to the progression and speed of progression uh, people make after uh, leaving their bodies. Um, so this makes it very difficult for people um, yeah, who die in a very negative way, people who are murdered, um, people who are tortured, um, people who die suddenly, um, people who commit suicide, uh, they tend to, to get stuck more often than people who have led a full life and die in their sleep. Um, but 
the same things yeah you can uh, you can you can do for them um, because what I find personally is that that most people who are stuck are stuck because of a desire or are stuck because of a longing uh, this happens the most often so they still want to experience the sunset or taste ice cream or uh, have something like this so they hang around and they look at people experiencing these things but it's a second-hand experience they cannot really absorb it totally and these desires are so strong that they pull them towards the world of the living but they have not enough consciousness to realize that if they would just let go of the world of the living they could get a new body and experience it again um, so often the lack of knowledge of reincarnation is, uh, is very problematic for spirits to move on. So many uh, people still have from their ego the fear of the unknown. And it's because they don't know what will happen when they let go of the physical world and the world of the living. They hold on with a kind of a death grip and a panic and do all kinds of things to, to, to keep oh, uh, their yeah, decaying energetic bodies intact rather than just going with the flow and yeah, moving on. And also the lack of contact with nature spirits is also very important in this. Because nature spirits, they don't have such an ego. And also animals don't have such an ego. So by looking at animals which are dying, who very easily move out of their body into next incarnations, um, that can really yeah, help people to yeah, learn from their example and follow their example and the more separated humans become from the animals uh, the more often they wander so with uh, people who live in contact with nature farmers hunters so-called yeah, primitive or aboriginal people they pretty much never have wandering spirits who are really trapped um, but in the more industrialized societies where people have separated themselves from animals and uh, nature spirits you see a lot of people yeah trapping themselves because they don't realize that animals are their teachers are their guides even both in life and after life so one of the things which yeah to me was ex yeah for some people very controversial controversial but also quite necessary at the time um, I once visited a, a cemetery in the Netherlands where due to uh, neglect basically they used to have processions there to uh, cleanse the cemetery and to keep the gates open but there hadn't been any processions for decades anymore the gate in the cemetery had yeah, shut itself and spirits could no longer leave anymore so one of the things we did there we uh, actually bought a fish in a pet shop and um, killed it in the cemetery and the fish upon dying um, yeah, went into the gate which we had reopened and it guided hundreds of dead humans uh, uh, and yeah all brought it brought them to a higher world so it went up and then it came back for those who did not see the gate and sit on the, see it go up and so it returned actually as a wandering spirit to collect the ones who still could not see it could not gather it until it could move all of them upwards and this is the nature of animal spirits they are very friendly they are very inclined to help us if we can only see them and learn from them it was the most beautiful yeah sacrifice very reminiscent to me of the of the sacrifice of Christ who also died to show us how to reach higher worlds um, so the last question I'm sure I have not been entirely complete but the lesson is carrying on for quite a while already um, but it is a very interesting topic um, to what uh, are there right and wrong burial rites? And do they matter at all? Um, so, yes, 
There are. Um, one of the, the, the uh, important things which are not done as much anymore um, is the wake and the washing of the body. Um, so, um, one of the things which, uh, uh, which happens is that um, when the person, in a way, uh, dies, they lose control over the remaining energy body. And in the remaining energy body, also in the physical part of it, there are often also a lot of repressed energies, repressed emotions, repressed fears, repressed thoughts, dogmas, all kinds of repressed stuff. And uh, all these repressed energies um, are still there. And when the person is no longer there repressing them, they will use up what life force is remaining to yeah, start the uh, transformation and uh, process, but also by absorbing this life force, they will, come, will become more strong. So, in a way, you get a big block of negative energy or, or personal shadow, um, which manifests itself in the physical body. Uh, of course, it's different with a saint because they yeah, don't have all this repressed junk, but all this repressed junk is also, yeah, in a way, what causes, in a way, the energetic body of the deceased person to have a very corrupt or very negative energy and if this energy is not dealt with this is also a very negative energy which will yeah still connect with the spirit which is trying to leave and by washing of the body actually the water absorbs all these energies and allows them to to, to drain away to flow away so that the person who died doesn't have to deal with them and the same is a little bit done with uh, undressing and redressing the body. So uh, usually after death, all these energies are also go into the clothes or into yeah, the water if you wash them or the oil if you wash them with oil. So there's various ways of cleansing it. Um, and actually the destruction also of the clothes, the burning of the clothes, which they wore at the moment of death, uh, also helps to get rid of all these energies um, so that the person is, is more liberated um, Um, the other thing is also uh, preventing um, negative energies from trapping this life force or stealing this life force or powers.